He lay in state, lay in the great hall of Britain's history, he who made history and wrote it. For barely had 1965 begun, when after 90 years, Winston Churchill departed his tremendous life. Paying our tribute to this nation's greatest son was farewell to a dear friend. Two and a half hours inviting cold it took from Lambeth Bridge to Westminster Hall. A pilgrimage abundantly rewarded when our turn came to file past. Past Sir Winston Churchill, Knight of the Garter, Saviour of Britain, and with it all, the man whom everyone called Winnie. And after the lying in state came the state funeral, the highest honour the nation could now pay. From Westminster, they bore him to St Paul's. Awaiting his mortal remains in London's cathedral where the Queen and a congregation of her former subjects and the great of almost every nation of the world. The sorrowing widow and her son led the family mourners. He lived for 90 years, lived to the full, until at last the old warrior was at rest. Churchill's world in his youth included Africa. The Blue Nile, pouring out of Lake Tana over the majestic Tissat Falls, one of the truly inspiring sights of the continent, was visited by the last sovereign under whom Winston served. Touring Ethiopia, Her Majesty was escorted by the Emperor Haile Selassie. On that happy occasion, neither Queen nor Emperor dreamt that when the year was ending, the shadow of Rhodesia would cloud the whole African scene. Host here to the Queen and Duke, Haile Selassie later presided over the meeting of the Organization of African Unity. There are no emperors in soccer, but Stanley Matthews was surely the prince of that great game when he at last retired. The foremost international stars were at Stoke City to mark his farewell as a first-class player. Matthews 11 versus World Stars. Puskas and the rest of them would have topped a million on the transfer market. They were now gladly paying tribute to the greatest gentlemen of the professional game. Some of these stars were unborn when the man they came to honor was of international class. What memories he had of more than 30 years in the top flight. The day had come at last for him to hang up his boots. In the front of his thoughts that day, surely Wembley Stadium. As we go over there, the cup final, 1965, that great match, Leeds versus Liverpool, had gone into extra time with the red-shirted Merseysiders on the attack. Hunt headed Liverpool's first goal. <laughs> Leeds hit back, Billy Bremner equalised. Extra time, second period, Liverpool lasting out better. Ian St. John scored the winning goal. The happiest man in football, Ron Yates, as he received the cup. If there is one trophy that can rival the FA Cup, it is the Derby Cup. Was it destined to go to France? Somewhere in the bunch, coming up the hill, was the cast-iron favourite Seabird II, which thousands of punters hoped would be first past the post. As the field swept on, Pathé's directional microphones captured the authentic, unique sounds of the Epsom Derby. Sure enough, it was victory for Seabird II. For racing of another kind, over to Cowes, where the world's keenest yachtsmen meet the challenge of the sea under sail. perhaps from deep sea ocean racers, there's nothing to equal cows. The Royal Yacht Squadron down there was in being more than 60 years before Winston Churchill was born. But in his 90 years, what changes, what achievements? 
the Kruakon Dam and its power station, for example. Who could have imagined it 90 years ago? It's the masterpiece of the North of Scotland hydroelectric scheme. Fittingly, it was inaugurated by the Queen. 1,300 feet above sea level, the dam impounds a head of water to drive the turbines. Tunneled three-quarter of a mile into the heart of Ben Cruachan is the Great Machine Hall, generating, when Her Majesty is switched on, enough power for a town of 200,000 people. Thirty thousand feet over the ocean flew the Super VC-10, one of the big achievements of 1965. Sir Giles Guthrie, chairman of BOAC, piloted the aircraft on a proving flight to the United States. In the 90 years spanned by Churchill's life, aviation conquered the skies from the balloon to jetliners. Coming in over Boston, the Super VC-10 showed to America's most sophisticated city, the world's most sophisticated airliner. And not only the Super VC-10s, the BAC-111 took the air to bring home the dollars. The 111 costs a million. Orders for a hundred quickly came in, helping the export trade to boom. For the new revolutionary Mini, the demand quickly spread over 160 countries. The little car has two pedal control. You scarcely need your left foot, except for getting in and out. You can change the gears by hand if you prefer to. At the top end of the scale, the new Rolls-Royce, the last word in luxury. And reappearing for one day only, the horseless carriages of 50 and more years ago. Veteran cameraman Ken Gordon on the active list for the veteran car run to film this kind of rally before World War I. With 1965 as a year of achievement, we can afford to look back to an age when these machines were something to boast about. If only Sir Winston had lived half a year longer, he would have marveled at the walk in space. For that breathtaking feat, 1965 will be notable in the annals of science, indeed in the history of mankind. Major Ed White was calmly making his way out of the capsule into space, about 200 miles above the Earth, traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, right outside the Earth's atmosphere. He and his fellow astronaut, and all the Americans concerned in the space project, merited the admiration of the world. I've only put the focus down to about eight feet or so. The flight director says get back in. Jim, uh, what guy is this for? Jimmy Four, get back in. Okay. 1965, a year in our time, a year no one will ever forget.